All right. Good evening and welcome to the San Dimas Candidates Forum. Uh, I'm your moderator this evening. My name is Brett Strauss. I'm an attorney here uh, out of the city of Claremont. I work for a company called Southland Data Processing, and I was invited here today because I don't have any ties to the local community, so uh, they invited me in as a uh, uh, somebody who can come in and ask the questions you know, without any uh, horse in the race, so to speak. So uh, I'm going to do my best to make sure that I stick to the format that was given. Uh, and we'll walk through the ground rules here momentarily. Uh, I'd first like to thank the audience, those of you for taking time out of your Thursday evening uh, to join us, uh, the city of San Dimas for putting on this great event, uh, K-West Television, so you'll notice that uh, we have a great crew here, and uh, this is being filmed and streamed live. Uh, the San Dimas Sheriff's Department, uh, the volunteers that make this possible. We have some great volunteers here up front that are going to uh, collect your questions, uh, as well as for all the candidates here uh, to my right for taking time out of their afternoon uh, to put on this event. So thank you all. Uh, the audience members are invited to listen uh, to the candidates as they present their positions and answer questions that you provide. This is not a debate, so you'll notice that you have uh, blank note cards on your seat. Uh, those are for your questions. So uh, if you'd like to take some time now to write down any questions that you might have. Um, when you're finished, you can hold your note card with the question in the air, and one of our volunteers will come and pick up the questions and bring them up front. If you run out of note cards and you need more, please feel free to grab one off of a neighboring seat or just simply raise your empty hand in the air and a volunteer will come and bring you more note cards. There's no limit on, on questions that you can submit, as many as you'd like. Uh, we ha have a time limit this evening at uh, 6.45 p.m., so unfortunately we can't stay all night and answer every question, uh, but the job of the volunteers here are going to be to uh, collect your questions, sort them by topic, and then they will bring them up here to me and I will then ask the candidates uh, the question. Okay? Uh, everybody will be posed the same question, so if, for example, we say, you know, what did you have for lunch? I'm going to start with Ruth. Emmett, I'm going to ask everybody the same question, okay? Uh, to keep everything fair. Okay? Um, again, as a reminder, this is an educational uh, opportunity to learn more about each candidate. It's open to the community, and it's going to be live streamed on the city's YouTube channel uh, along with uh, the new K-West stream. So at this time, would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I'm now going to take a few minutes here to walk through uh, the overview of the forum for the guidelines so that everybody's on the same page and you know how we're going to operate this evening. Uh, when it comes to seating, the candidates, uh, the seating of the candidates are, is determined by the order of their names on the ballot. That's why they are seated the way that they are. Okay? Uh, this also determines the order that they'll be speaking this evening. Okay? And then at the closing remarks, we're going to reverse the order. Okay? The format of tonight's event, we're going to start off uh, with an opening statement. Each candidate is going to take a moment uh, to deliver their opening statement. Okay. Uh, I've been given a written statement from uh, candidate Eric Nakano, who couldn't be with us this evening, so I have his opening statement. I'll deliver that on his behalf. Okay. Then I also have a, a closing statement. Okay. Uh, then we'll go through our questions, and again, as I just mentioned, we'll do the closing statement at the very end. Okay. The opening statement, each candidate will have two minutes for their opening statement. A timekeeper seated right here up, up front. Uh, we'll signal after one minute has elapsed and then again when the two minutes are up. The order of the speaking will be determined by the order of the names on the ballot. The use of electronic devices is prohibited, so no phones, no laptops, no iPads. Uh, the candidates are permitted to have index cards, notepads, uh, you know, and a pen if they'd like. The question response, so after we're through with the opening statements, uh, I will ask the written questions that are now being collected from you, the audience members, okay? The non-resident volunteer panel, uh, that's over here on, on my left, 
but will consolidate those pertaining to the same subject and remove any questions that are personal in nature uh, or not relevant to any local issues. Each candidate will have one minute to answer the question. Uh, I'll pause and I'll, I'll ask the, quest the same question of each candidate as I just mentioned. And the timekeeper up front will notify uh, me at the end of the one minute so that way I can intervene if necessary and pass it along to the next candidate. I've also been given uh, a, a list on, uh, to rotate each of the questions. So the order of responses will change for each of the questions that are provided. Uh, additional housekeeping, there will be no campaign signs, clothing, or banners of any type uh, permitted inside the venue. Okay. Any electioneering and fundraising is also not permitted. Candidates were responsible for notifying their supporters of all the rules. Okay. Uh, candidates may bring campaign literature to the information area, which you saw when you walked in. So please, if you, ha if you didn't get a chance on the way in, uh, stop on your way out to take a look at all of the materials outside. The candidates will also make themselves available after the forum to answer any questions that you may have that will also take place outside uh, in, in the roundtable. At the closing statement, each candidate will also then be allowed one minute for, the, for their closing statement. The timekeeper will signal at the end of the one minute, and there will be no substitute speakers. Okay. Moving forward into our opening statement, the first candidate to deliver an opening statement will be Ruth. Thank you. I want to thank City Hall and the League of Women Voters for hosting this event. I also want to thank the San Dimas Sheriffs for ensuring our safety and security. I stand for family, community, and service, the values we uphold as city and neighbors. I hold a Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry and a Master's of Science in Secondary Education with an emphasis in teaching science. I'm currently the treasurer for the foundation at Mount SAC, and I've coached both San Dimas Little League and AYSO for over eight years. I will be a mayor who will inquire, interact, and seek to balance the budget while shrinking our deficit. I will be a mayor who will seek to develop our community while maintaining our small town charm. I will be a mayor who values all residents and seeks to hear your voice. I look forward to your questions, and thank you. Thank you, Ruth. All right, Emmett. Good evening. My name is Emmett Vadar, and tonight I recommit myself to continue serving as your mayor. I get to start over? Yes, sir. Okay, just checking. Good evening. My name is Emmett Vadar, and tonight I recommit myself to continue serving as your mayor. My vision is simple, to prepare San Dimas for the next 30 years. When I am re-elected on June 7th, I will focus, focus on three things. One, by leveraging my decades of dedicated leadership experience, I will continue to foster the partnerships we've built, both the foundation and the guidance we'll need for the road ahead. There is room for all points of view, but let's stay committed to our shared values while working through our opportunities and disagreements instead of settling for cheap, short-term sound bites. We must work these issues through respectfully. Two, we must continue to learn from lessons and successes of the pandemic. It was a difficult time, tragic for some. We've learned how to communicate differently, make hard decisions faster, and how to be better. I'm proud to say that community services never stopped during the pandemic. We delivered Meals on Wheels and groceries for those in need. We show drive-in movies, produce videos, and promote local businesses. Learn a little bit more about the downside of technology and make course corrections in, in how we communicate. In short, we learn to do it better and are now better prepared for it. Three, now that they are fully reopened from the pandemic, I have a laser focus on safety, security, and partnerships in developing a multi-year budget of focus on future priorities today to maintain our roads, parks, facilities, programs, and in general, keep San Dimas beautiful. The full development of the Cataract Bonita region of the city, both north and south of the Gold Line. Proactively work to stay ahead 
of the state's increasing housing growth requirements and to work to refresh the City Hall's culture of how to get to yes with an emphasis on customer service. Thank you. Thank you, Emmett. Uh, I will now read the opening statement that was provided by candidate Eric Nakano. Good evening, residents. I'm sorry that I'm un unable to join you in person this evening. As many of you know, I tested positive for COVID-19 and guidelines require that I isolate myself to prevent the infection of others. While I was looking forward to meeting you, it's critical that as leaders, we put the well-being of our residents first. And just as I am doing so tonight, I will always do so. San Dimas is facing many challenges, including a $2 million budget deficit, a rise in, in crimes such as theft, and questions about how to best develop our downtown. Despite these challenges, I believe that our city's best days lay ahead. I am running for city council because I have the skills, background, and a plan to address all of these challenges and more. To fix our budget, I will ensure that we are spending our tax dollars wisely. That's why I've spent hours going through the budget with city staff to identify options for bringing it into balance again. To address crime, I will partner with community groups, optimize our use of technology, and implement the right policies to reduce crime in the most effective way possible. To improve our downtown, I will provide the right level of oversight to develop it correctly, starting with Pioneer Square. I'll work to require enough parking to maximize the impact on residents and ensure the project is financially viable. I grew up in San Dimas and this is my home. After graduating from local public schools, I earned my bachelor's in public policy from George Washington University and my MBA with a focus in finance from Duke University. Since then, I've worked both in the private and public sectors ad advising the federal government and Fortune 500 companies before landing my current role as an executive at a tech company. I credit my success to what I learned in San Dimas, the importance of hard work, having a problem-solving mindset, and working as a team to get things done. I want to take all that I've learned and help solve the challenges our city's facing, and I want to give back to the community that's given me so much. Thank you. Next will be Brandon. Good evening, neighbors. My name is Brandon Moon, and I wanted to start off by giving you a little background on why I'm running for office. I have been a lifelong resident of San Gabriel Valley, and I am fortunate enough to call San Dimas my home, but more so to call you my neighbors. I attended middle school at San Gabriel Christian School and graduated from Temple City High School. After graduating high school, I joined the hospitality industry, a legacy in the Moon household. I earned a leadership role, excuse me, I earned a leadership role enabling me to travel nationwide to train staff in new restaurant openings. I attended Los Angeles Trade Technical College where I earned an associate's in science in electrical construction and maintenance. In 2018, I was given the opportunity to join the sales team of a minority woman-owned electrical distributor and I've grown with the company as a territory sales manager of the Inland Empire. Given the opportunity to be your council member of District 2, I pledge to seek reasonable and fair solutions to many community issues such as public safety. I believe in adopting programs like the Citizens Academy to strengthen the bond between local residents and our Sheriff's Department. I am honored and privileged to have received endorsements from our first responders such as the Professional Police Officers Association, Association for Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs, and the International Firefighters Association Local 1014. My reason is my passion for public service and the love for this great city of San Dimas. As your councilman, I promise to be a good listener and not just a talker. My core values and my desire to do what is right is what drives me to serve the community. As your council member, I will fight for our residents that demand accountability, transparency, and integrity from our municipal leaders. And as a cancer survivor of three years, I know what it means to fight. Tonight is all about meeting your candidates. I encourage you to take notes, learn as much as you can before making your decision. If there's any topic or specific Okay, Brandon, question, thank you. Ryan. Could you repeat the question, please? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good afternoon, good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, 
I am running unopposed, so I'm probably going to give you the most straight talk out of anybody up here tonight. Uh, but that being said, I do want to thank the chamber. Um, I appreciate the format in which they're conducting this, all the volunteers, the sheriff's department, everybody else that came out, and the community, you, the voters. This is what this is about, making informed decisions. This election, when I ran in 2017, uh, I vowed to bring some change to the city. It was a tough race. And through that race, I vowed to bring more transparency, more accountability. Uh, and we have. You've seen a turnover in the city's leadership. You've seen a new city manager. You've seen things that otherwise had not been seen before. We're paying attention to what's going on in our equestrian center. We're paying attention to the equestrian community. We're looking at what's going on with the budget. Things that otherwise weren't paid attention to, we looked under the hood. Since then, we've looked at bringing audits on board. We've invested in public safety. We have cameras in our parks. We have a flock safety system that's helping us catch bad guys left and right and get those mail criminals that are stealing our mail and getting our catalytic converters and the like. I've had a great learning experience. My first three years was a hurdle, as many of you who've paid attention have seen. Since then, the council changed in 2020 and we've been making awesome progress. The people that are here, the, your city staff, their team, the new leadership team is carrying our city forward. You're gonna hear people talking about how the city has a $2 million budget deficit. It's rubbish. In fact, tomorrow night you're going to see the city's gonna produce a surplus of $200,000 in this year's budget. The bottom line is tonight isn't about what we could spin. Tonight's about an election of facts and truth. And I hope that you pay attention to what everybody says and I hope you do your homework and you really seek out the facts and what's going on here this evening. And even by the candidate that can't be here tonight who will have the opportunity to prepare statements and not sit up here for two minutes or one minute and make a statement. So thank, thank you, Ryan. you so much. Okay. Thank you. Just to, Ken, it's just a reminder to please uh, scoot the microphone as close to you as possible so make better for better uh, audio on on TV guys all right first question uh, starting with Ruth what can the council do to modernize the city of San Dimas thank you very much one of the things the council can do to modernize the city of San Dimas is social media advertising. We should be advertising on Instagram, we could be advertising on Facebook, and we could also be advertising on other social media platforms. Other cities do the same thing. So that's one thing. We could also be using My San Dimas as advertising as well. If we used My San Dimas to advertise and ask for advertisement, that would work too. We could also try to do some entertainment in downtown town so if we had some kind of walk where every antique shop maybe did a different type of um, I don't know a cocktail for a specific generation that would be advertising as well advertisement and social media platforms okay. thank you Ruth <laughs> Emmett what can the council do to modernize the city of San Dimas it's really simple listen to Ruth because she has the right answer to tell you the truth we're but we are involved in social media. The city is, they've just reworked their uh, website. The bottom line to it is Mike Sandemus was invented with, within the last six months to a year. We brought it to us and it's become an, an, an instrument that's absolutely phenomenal. You walk, you walk down the street, you see something, you can put, get right there, put it on there and the staff gets back to you within a few hours or within a couple of days. So it really works. We, uh, uh, it's funny that we talk about doing something in the downtown. This morning I was attended the uh, Bonita Corridor group and that was a discussion because of the fact that we're going to be closing the downtown streets for the bridge. So those are, those are things we're doing. We also have now generated and now bring in better communications through the all right thank you Emmett thank you. Brandon what can this the council do to modernize the city of San Dimas I think the relationship between the council and the Chamber of Commerce is crucial in this particular circumstance um, we can promote um, businesses that we don't necessarily have available to the community we can embrace the businesses that we do have and use social media to uh, advertise. Um, we can do things such as like a green audit, you know, the race to zero, for lack of a better term. Um, become more reliant 
self-reliant than dependent on foreign oils. Um, there's a lot of areas that we can improve, specifically in downtown, you know, provide support to the businesses that are there that are looking to grow or expand. Um, develop a specific plan and a target market. I mean, what are we trying to accomplish? We're embracing what we have and want to, you know, in, embrace exactly where we're headed. Thank you. All right, Ryan, what can the council do to modernize the city of San Dimas? Thank you for the question. You know, we're doing it. The city, when I got elected, had invested in a cella, and that was aimed to help people to track what we're doing in terms of permitting process. It's what's allowing you to interact with your city in a whole different way. We brought on board My San Dimas, the app you can download on your phone. You can do code complaints on there. You can request services. We've, ex we've invested in Wi-Fi in downtown, and we're looking to expand the Wi-Fi to be able to have public access for that across the city. We've invested in flock safety to assist our law enforcement and apprehending criminals in the community, and we need to expand on those efforts, which hopefully we'll see in an upcoming budget. These investments realistically need to focus on you, making it more easy for us as citizens to interact with our city and get the services that we deserve as that's who the city serves, is you. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, the second question, Emmett, we'll start with you on the second question, which is, what possible consequences do you expect for our city uh, now that we're bringing in the gold line? How much time do we have? <laughs> the, the problem with us bringing the gold line is, is a great thing. We're gonna be bringing it in, people are gonna be able to transport between city and city, but it brings handicaps. It brings a lot of parking problems that that nobody's even thinking about with the city's thinking about it, the goal line's thinking about it, but they're all thinking about it in different directions. We got uh, Pioneer Square coming, and that's got a parking issue. So that is going to be a handicap. A handicap of, with, the tr uh, with the goal line coming is also going to, to upheaval a little bit more of our unhoused uh, residents, people coming in from other cities, coming to stay there, be homeless, uh, if, for lack of another word, uh, they're going to, every city between here and Pasadena has had the same problem. When the train comes, more homeless come along with it. They get off here, they realize what a great city we have, so they stick around and stay. And so that's an issue that's going to happen. Uh, Gold Line uh, is a, could be a great, great addition to the city of San Dimas. Thank you, Ahmed. It could be. Next, we have Brandon. Brandon, what possible consequences do you expect for our city uh, with the gold line coming in? Well, to, uh, uh, excuse me, to elaborate on Emmett's points, you know, of the uh, homelessness and public safety issues, uh, those are concerns that are valid and that will be addressed. They, we have uh, developed plans and are researching and are afforded the benefit of having our sister cities, whether it be Azusa, Monrovia, Pasadena, that we can learn from because they've already gone through it. Granted, there will be some negative consequences. There's a lot of positive. Since the adoption of the 11.5 miles from Azusa to Pasadena, it has provided $930 million in direct and indirect business revenues and over 7,000 jobs. It's an economic catalyst for local economy. Seeing as you know, there may be an influx in crime and or homelessness, there are programs such as having LA County Sheriff's deputies specifically assigned to the stations or to be commuters on the trains. These are not new problems. They're problems we need to get in front of. And Thank you, Brandon. <clears throat> Ryan, what possible consequences do you expect for our city with the gold line coming in? Thank you for the question. Plenty, plenty of consequences. Homelessness, parking, parking impacts in our downtown, the downtown core. We're already seeing parking challenges already. If you try to go to pick up some cupcakes in downtown or maybe run to the ATM, you know what's going on there. We need parking enforcement. We need to supplement that parking. We've already looked as a council at implementing parking districts in certain areas and not charging people when there's a public amenity that is causing that. If you want to know what you can do, you call the Metro Board and you let them know we want the train to be safe. 
We don't want transit ambassadors. We want sworn law enforcement on that train, on those buses, addressing all of the negative impacts that are gonna come here to our city. And because we have a city prosecutor's office, we need to look locally at what we can do to be able to hold people accountable for running a fence to any sort of quality of life issue that we don't want here in our city. Thank you. Okay, Ruth, what possible consequences do you expect for our city with the gold line coming in? Well, the first one, the biggest one is going to be the parking lot. Since there's no contractual agreement for the parking lot at this moment, we're talking about a $23 million price tag if we have to relocate the maintenance yard. That does not include the cost of the land for eminent domain. That's another $5 million. So, I mean, if we're going to consider the parking ride, then that displaces residents. Nobody wants to do that. And people are already going to park in the residential communities to begin with. So, I mean, I would consider trying to find, you know, trying to extend the timeline there so that we can figure out a way to finance this because to be quite frank with you it's kind of a mess either that or we're gonna to have to figure out a way to get 1.3 to 1.4 million dollars per year to try to finance that parking lot and I just can't see a way in which we're gonna do that at this moment now in terms of the transient issue that of course is going to be a concern we probably are going to need to want to put cameras at the Metro and we need to find a way to make it ADA accessible but I will say this the elderly in our community are looking forward to the Thank metro you, Ruth. because many can't see. Good. Moving on to the third question, Brandon, uh, we'll start with you. Do you think the city of San Dimas should bring in marijuana dispensaries to increase uh, revenues? Simple answer, not in my city. There is a place for everything and it's not in San Dimas, um, bottom line. Um, I black and white. Um, thank you. Uh, Ryan, do you think the city of San Dimas should bring in marijuana dispensaries to increase revenue to the city? Unequivocally, no. And the bottom line is this. After Prop 64, the city council took quick and swift action to be able to prohibit the sale, the distribution, the delivery of cannabis to anywhere, anyone in the city. If you want to go get it, you can get it outside of the city, you can bring it to your home, that is your right. Uh, but the bottom line is, cities have looked at this and some people seem to think it's a revenue generator. It's not. In fact, most of the cities have seen challenges in public safety. They've seen the sale of other drugs that became decriminalized essentially under Prop 47. So now you have methamphetamine going on, you have illegal gambling operations going on in a lot of these places. And to anyone who has knowledge that there are places selling marijuana illegally in the city, I believe they have a moral, ethical, and frankly compelling responsibility to report them to code and to the sheriff's department. We need to keep our community safe, clean, and frankly keep the character that we all know and love. Thank you. Ruth, do you think the city of San Dimas should bring marijuana dispensaries to increase revenue? Uh, no. I think every one of us uh, probably are in the same place on this particular issue. There's no way that it's going to increase revenue. In fact, I think what it will do, even if it brought in revenue, it's also going to bring in a tremendous number of problems on the issue. So I think absolutely not. Plus, we don't want to subject our kids to that. I'm a teacher. I don't, I don't want to subject our students to a place that's going to be selling, to, to any type of, any kind of place that would be selling marijuana to my students. Not my kids, not in my school, not in my district. Thank you. Thank you. And Emmett, do you think the city of San Dimas should bring marijuana dispensaries in to increase revenue to the city? The best part of my uh, position here is we're, that I get to answer it with all their, all their, <laughs> hell no, we won't go. It's just not gonna, it's, just, it's not. It's, <laughs> making rec, the state made Prop 64, made it legal, okay, but although the law provides that marijuana is illegal, and the vast majority of, in the market remains still underground because of taxing and, and that, that, things like that, law provides that local cities have the power to ban weed as they see fit. Majority of the cities in the state of California have banned it. 
and, and it's just not possible. I am proud to have been part of a city council that voted to pass regulations prohibiting cannabis shops within the city limits. It's the right thing for our community, and I think we all believe that, that uh, you are the people and your children are the people that we represent. Uh, no, absolutely, positively not. Back to that, hell no, we won't go. Thank you, Emmett. Okay, uh, question number four, we're gonna start with you, Ryan. What are your thoughts on the defund the police movement and can you envision a scenario where our San Dimas Sheriff would need to be defunded? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It's just laughable, frankly. The question's even laughable. Um, as many of you know, uh, I am a lieutenant my, by job. My, I work for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. I am not representing them in any which way here tonight, but I am allowed to disclose my profession and my job. I can tell you this. We've seen catalytic converter thefts, property crime. We've seen all kinds of things going on here. We need to protect our community, and that means we need to keep it safe. I'm proud of the city council. I recused myself from the vote, but the city council did vote to add a motor deputy. We had one of the first motor deputies in Los Angeles County here in the city. In fact, when I campaigned the first time, there's a picture of me on a motor. That motor is Chris Blasnick's bike, who was a motor here in our community. And I used to bring him food when he actually do traffic enforcement on the block where I grew up. So the bottom line is no, we need to double down. We need to support the recall of the DA who's not helping keep our community safe. And we need to support our deputies. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Ruth, what are your thoughts on the defund the police movement and can you envision a scenario where our San Dimas Sheriff would need to be defunded? No, I cannot. 10 years ago, I was asleep on my couch, pregnant with a baby and someone broke into our house. Can you imagine what that's like? We've had our truck stolen. My husband has had the copper leads on his truck stolen twice. We've had our windows shot out. Do you think I want to defund the police? I'd rather have more police because I've been a victim of crime over and over and over again. And I live right behind the high school. So no, I cannot imagine that. In fact, I would rather have more police. I would rather have someone there for us because I cannot imagine that. Could you? No, I cannot see that scenario. I think our police are necessary and they're here to serve our community. And I thank them for their service. Thank you, Ruth. Okay, Emmett, what are your thoughts on the defund the police movement and can you envision a scenario where our San Dimas Sheriff would need to be defunded? Well, as most people in this room know, that I spent 36 years on LAPD, so what would you think about me thinking about defunding the police? That's, a, that's another one of those, hell no, we won't go. It's absolutely ridiculous. It, it's ridiculous when you watch everything in our nation, everything that's coming on our state, and do you wanna see that in the city of San Dimas? I can't imagine it. We have four or five deputies here tonight, okay? Why? Because we believe that we need to be safe. The city has got to be safe. We talked about the uh, catalytic converters. There's still six to eight catalytic converters a month being sold here in San Dimas, and we're putting resources out there, marking them. Um, anyone who believes that we should defund any law enforcement agency or, or any public service, like the, the uh, fire department or anything, has got to be just on a different planet than the, than the one that I'm on. Because the reality is, plain and simple. Thank you, Emmett. Thank you. Brandon, what are your thoughts on the defund the police movement? And can you envision a scenario where our San Dimas sheriff would need to be defunded? I couldn't agree with Emmett more. I mean, there is no circumstance where that it, it would be feasible to defund the police. How can you defund an organization that has yet to be completely funded? You know, with the sheriff's department that we have now, last year crime was down 6%. Year to date, we're down 16%, and that's being not completely funded. You know, we have programs in place such as the flock cameras that Eric, or excuse me, that Ryan spoke to. Um, these are, have been instrumental in 
tracking down the individuals that are coming from outside our neighborhoods, targeting our vehicles or property. And, you know, these have, we, we've been able to prosecute these individuals because of programs like this. By defunding, um, you're, you're just basically leaving your doors unlocked. It, it is it, ridiculous to even consider a circumstance where that would be relevant. R relevant. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving along, question number five. We're gonna start with Ruth. Ruth, can we look forward to some new businesses downtown? Well, I would certainly hope that we could look forward to some new businesses in the downtown area. Um, I believe that we have had new businesses in our downtown area and we continue to grow and thrive. A matter of fact, that is the entire purpose of PSQ. So the Pioneer Square project, once it gets undergoing, that will not only be housing, but it will also be businesses and restaurants and it will bring revenue and income on the tune of somewhere in the neighborhood, if I'm correct, $4 billion once it gets underway. So we can afford to see that and that's right next to our downtown area. So given that the PSQ Q project will bring revenue and businesses, I think that yes, we can afford to see that within our downtown area. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Emmett, can we look forward to some new businesses downtown? Absolutely. We have, uh, we're working at many, many levels. As uh, Ruth said, the Pioneer Square project, uh, I'm not quite sure that's going to bring forth $4 billion in revenue, but if it does, we're, we're in great shape. The reality is there are new businesses every day being, come out, not, excuse me, not every day, but I was at a meeting this morning where there were three new businesses that just starting up within the last three or four months. We need, we all go to other cities to restaurants. Our problem is downtown, the buildings are, are old and they're owned by people who don't, well, all they want is their rent checks because they're, they're starting to feel their age. Uh, but along with PSQ will come the additional west side of the bridge. The other side, so we're going to have a new town and an old town. Right now we're looking at old town, but new town is going to come. It's going to bring restaurants. It's going to be more businesses. So we all should encourage that type of, of atmosphere in our, in our city. So yes, I believe that there will be a new heightened development in the San Dimas area. Thank you, Emmett. Brandon, can we look forward to some new businesses downtown? Absolutely, and uh, I think to kind of circle back on the first question, you know, the relationship between the chamber and council um, will be proved to be instrumental in this particular circumstance. Um, you know, you target specific businesses that you want to bring to the community, that us as residents want to shop at, want to spend our hard-earned money. Um, you know, you, you build specific plans, uh, you draft dev design standards, um, as Emmett touched on, you know, some of the buildings are you're getting up there in age and, um, you know, you, you appeal to the types of businesses that you want to promote. Um, you know, there's a reason we all live here and there's a reason we all shop here. And, you know, to continue to build on that, um, we absolutely can expect to see new businesses. There's, the, the possibility is endless with, you know, uh, things like the downtown specific plan where a group of uh, city officials and residents get together and talk about the possibility of new business and development. Um, all these things will secure. Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> Ryan, can we look forward to some new businesses downtown? No. no I'm just kidding. Of course, I'm say yes. <laughs> so it's a, thank you for the question, but. The thing is this, every, every year we see new businesses, and I know, and you hear it, and we all know it, we happen to have a rather robust catalog of hair and nail salons, and we all know this, it's one of the top places, but if you know that, you know that we have some very talented hair folks and salons here in the city. In fact, you have people flying from Vegas and all over the place to come to some of these places. The reality of it is this, and the mayor talked about it, I'm proud to have led the city a, a delegation to go to Las Vegas to go to Recon, a developer convention, because it's not as simple as saying, hey, are there going to be new businesses? No. It takes zoning. It takes effort. It takes meeting with people, believing in them and their vision 
and then getting the city to get on board to support that vision and changing municipal code if we need to, allowing the downtown, which we've now done to stay open later past nine o'clock. Oh my goodness, it's like Footloose. We want to have a dance. Thank you, Ryan. To do it. Okay, question six here. We're going to start with you, Emmett. Uh, the question here is, uh, it says, I've lived in San Dimas for three decades and I've always enjoyed the neighborly feel of our city. Over the past few years, I've witnessed a decline in civility in both the community and on the city council. What can we expect you to do to help rebuild our community and bring people back together? Certain things that, certain things that happened in this city over the last year uh, are actually embarrassing. Should be, should be, it should be flat noted that the city council has been very separated. We need to figure out how to bring that back under one roof where everybody's kind of thinking that we're working for San Dimas and not for individual type uh, situations. I will continue to, to, to work with each and every one of the councilmen and each and every community member who wants to be able to be a part of it. We are now talking about things that to bring people together. And that, uh, like days of dialogue, at the end of the month, we're gonna be sponsoring a, along with other agencies, sponsoring an opportunity for people to talk about what they have, they feel. If they feel like they're being, you know, dis, disorganized or did not paid attention to. So that's what we're going to do and we're gonna to continue to work together, bringing community groups together. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you. Brandon, what can we expect you to do to help rebuild our community and be, bring people back together? It's no secret that there's a, an obvious divide in council and the fact of the matter is um, their ideas aren't necessarily that far apart. There isn't much difference. It's, it's more of a difference in personalities. I look to be the conduit. I look to be not only on council but as a resident of San Dimas. It's not my opinions and my decisions, it's the opinions of our residents. Um, you know, listening, um, like I hinted on in my opening statement. I can talk all day long, but that's not why I'm here. I'm a good listener, and I take your ideas, and I submit them to council, and I am one-fifth of the vote, and that's, that's what I plan on doing. Ryan, what can we expect you to do to help rebuild our community and bring people together? My time starts when I start talking, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's no secret the council has had a kind of challenging 24 months. I would hold to you that it's not the council. It's one council member who's uncompromising. And I'll tell you what you don't do. You don't have your family start a newspaper, put hit pieces out on the city. You don't go and start a podcast putting out falsehoods and misinformation. What you do is you come to the table. You come work with the people who are here. You respect the votes of the whole citizenry here in the city. And even as a council member, you listen to the four other people. If you have questions about that, look at the votes in the last 24 months. You will see those votes bear out. The majority of the city council Four of them work, compromise, and get things done for the citizens without the nonsense, without the charades, without the backdoor politics. That's what we're going to do, and I look forward to a new council member, hopefully, that is not going to play that game, is going to be Thank honest you, Ryan. and respectful. Ruth, what can we expect you to do to help rebuild our community and bring people together? Well, as a teacher, that's what we do. So I work with parents and students and community members all the time, and we all have divergent ways of thinking, but our goal is simple. It's the education of a child. So when I work in council, the goal will be simple. What is the best nature for the city of San Dimas? I'm not doing this for myself, I'm doing it for the city. And if all members can sit together in equity and we speak with each other in equity for the, what is the best nature for the city of San Dimas, 
then we will accomplish the goal. It doesn't matter if we have differences of opinion. What we need to do is what is in the best nature of the city, and that's exactly what I will do. I will work in equity, I will assist each other, and I will hold listening sessions, and I will be sure that I, I do things in fairness, not for me, but what is in the best nature of the city. And for the residents, I'll hold listening sessions, and I'll talk to them, and I will go to the town halls, and I actually think the day of dialogue is an amazing idea. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Okay, question number seven. Just a, one more reminder, guys. Make sure you have that mic uh, close so we can hear you clearly. Uh, we'll start with you, Brandon. How important is a candidate's experience and ties to the city in creating a strong voice on city council? I think it's crucial. I mean, I think life experience is everything. I mean, it affords you the opportunity to, to form opinions and on important matters. Um, I think living in San Dimas for the past six years and in San Gabriel Valley my entire life, I've been able to experience you know, growth, um, development, see um, a city that has embraced its Western heritage and seen Western days come and go and possibly in the future you know, get our rodeos back. Um, I am, uh, I am tongue-tied right now, to be completely honest with you. And I'm going to hand it over to Ryan. <laughs> he must, yeah. Ryan is next. So Ryan, how important is a candidate's experience and ties to the city in creating a strong voice in the council? Thank you for the question. It's huge. And the bottom line is, uh, growing up here in San Dimas, this is my hometown. Uh, my mom and dad, I live seven doors down from them. My wife and I are here. I lived in downtown LA for one year, experienced homelessness, mass transportation, and all the other challenges that we're looking to do. And you have to have life experience. You also have to be able to work with people. And you also have to have that quaint character, integrity, and fortitude to be the Sandemians that we are and meet us at the table, talk to each other, help each other out, and really have those frank conversations. It's huge, and I hope everybody up here uh, carries those qualities. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Ruth, how important is a candidate's experience and ties to the city in creating a strong voice on the council? I think experience and ties to a city are very important. My husband and I, we moved here over 20 years ago because we wanted to have a place to raise a family, and this was it. You know, and then we had kids and I gave my children something that I never had, and that was a home. I'm a product of a military family, so I moved around a lot. And then I coached my kids because I wanted my children to see that service is important in being a part of an involved community member. So I coached them. Baseball, I was a baseball coach. Can you imagine that? You know, and soccer, I coached them in soccer. I was involved in everything because I wanted them to see that ties to the community make you the person that you can be. So yes, it's important. It's not just important in terms of being a candidate for a race, but it's important in terms of showing the community that you matter and that they matter. So of course it matters. You know, and, and I wanna say further to that point that for all of us, being involved in some way, shape, or capacity is important. Thank you, Thank Ruth. You. Emmett, how important is a candidate's experience and ties to the city in creating a strong voice on the council? I lived in the city of San Dimas for the last 39 years. I've been involved with the city for the past 34 years. I was part of a, a committee that went out have fought for the, the sheriff station. I have a retired council member with me here who fought for the new station. Uh, the reality is that people need to be coached. Get out there, you talk to them, you spend some time with them, get them to, be, to become involved. Uh, I spend hours and hours a, a month talking with people in downtown, talking up in the, in the valley or the, the Via Verde area and everything, and we spend a tremendous time, you, you get what you put into it. If you don't put something into it, okay, you're not gonna get it. And I know there's a lot of folks here who have been touched by me at one time or another because I go out and, and I get you involved. Thank you. Thank you, Emmett. Okay. 
Moving on, uh, question number eight. We're gonna start with you, Ryan. What is your stance on supporting city volunteer groups and how can we uh, and get the funding, excuse me, to support those groups? Thank you. Well, those that know where I started uh, in the city know that I have huge support for our volunteer group. 2015, I was on the Public Safety Commission. Uh, someone who happens to be in this room uh, who's in uniform as a volunteer came over and said, hey, we want to get the community emergency response team off the ground. And that was a huge program to increase a volunteer base to be able to respond to emergencies and make the community more aware and prepared for those emergencies. Since then, after getting elected, we went ahead and have now recognized CERT as part of the city's disaster plan and the city has made allocations in the budget to be able to support that volunteer group. That's above and beyond the countless hours that we get from the Historical Society, the Chamber, as well as McKinley's and everywhere else. Volunteerism in the city is huge. There's a volunteer recognition dinner tomorrow night and I am so very proud of all the hours that people put in their service and they are engaged in this city and we're very blessed to have them. So I value it, I support it, and I have gone out of my way to make sure that the city does too. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth, what is your stance on supporting city volunteer groups and the funding that's gonna be necessary to support those groups? Um, I absolutely support city um, volunteer groups, and as far as the funding, if there's not a line item in the budget, then you can't actually support that. So that's number one. You have to ensure that for these volunteer groups, there's a line item in the budget, and that that line item in the budget is specific for what the volunteer groups are doing. I would love to see our library come back. I would love to see our city, our city, yes, I would. I would love to see our volunteer groups also continue to have that line item in the budget so that they can be supported um, they can be supported in the way in which they need to be and so from anything from the Public Safety Commission to like I said our libraries to all of our city run groups I support them just as I'm sure anybody in here would do because they are the bread and butter of what allows our city of San Dimas to be able to function the way that it does and allows us to have the city the quaintness and the love of our city that we have thank you The city of San Dimas cannot function without volunteers. I think everybody in this room knows it. We have from volunteers from the Chamber of Commerce, the people that are here today running this uh, uh, forum. Uh, look around, there are all types of organizations right here today that are, are representative of our volunteers. And behind them, there are hundreds more. And uh, funding, uh, as Ryan said, CERT, we've now taken that on as a line item in, in the city's uh, emergency uh, preparedness operation. Uh, we all understand that uh, the Sheriff's Department, our boosters, they represent and provide services for our mountain rescue, our volunteers on patrol, but it just doesn't stop with law enforcement. It starts with who's handing out barbecue on the birthday barbecue, who's standing in that line, Okay, I, I can really look out here and see many, many folks that have been here working Thank you, Emmett. endlessly. To elaborate on Emmett's point, you know, our, our city could not function without volunteers. You know, everything from the men and women in these white uniforms that have responded to my residence specifically when my truck has been broken in twice to file reports. You know, the funding would not be an issue. Contrary to popular belief, we do not have a $2 million deficit. On the contrary, we're in the top 7% of financially stable cities in the state of California. Out of 482 cities, top 7%. It wouldn't be an issue. If there was a suggestion to council that we needed a new volunteer organization, it's a majority vote and you get funding. They create a, a, a separate account for it. It's as simple as that. These men and women that volunteer, whether it be handing out hot dogs at the city's birthday or the CERT program, you know, code enforcement, whatever it may be, taking the time out of their own day because of the passion for service and the city that they live in, it speaks waves. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the closing statement now, candidates. I'll give you a second to, to get your ducks in a row here. We're going to start with Ryan. Just one second here, and then we'll, uh, we'll go in reverse order. So Ryan, Brandon, 
Uh, I'll step in and read uh, Eric's closing statement, Emmett, and then we'll close with Ruth. Okay. Did it make right. noise? Huh. Okay, Ryan. All right, I'm just gonna speak from the heart. You know, it's been a great honor to serve the last five years uh, because the city had to comply with some laws. And so uh, Council Member Bertone and I, our terms got extended by 12 months and then another few months. Uh, and I think if I recall correctly, we're the longest serving single term individuals in state history is what I was told at five months and four, five years and four months or whatever it's been. Um, I really look forward to continuing my service. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to serve my hometown here, to serve each one of you. Um, I've always been accessible to each one of you, even in matters that we may not agree on. I've always offered to meet with people even when you don't call. Um, but I will continue to do that to those who have opposing views. And I look forward to working with those groups. I look forward to the city council getting back to doing the people's business, undistracted, not noise, not nonsense, but really doing what we need to do for you to ensure the best service, to ensure that you are getting what you need to out of our community and that we're serving you the best way we can. We need to continue to expand our parks and rec programs. We need to expand transparency programs here in the city. You can see a transparency portal uh, as it relates to the election. You can see who's taking money from who. I encourage you to take a look at that. See who's funding your candidates that are sitting up here in this race. I encourage you to go look at all of these things and do simple Facebook searches for all of it and Google each one of our names. I'm not, I have nothing to hide. I am very much honored to be here and represent you guys and the 4th District, the newly formed 4th District, and uh, please vote. Whether you vote for uh, any of the candidates up here, uh, just participate, be active. That's what's important. God bless each one of you, and I wanna thank my wife for standing by me for this first term. I love you. I know it's not been easy. People don't realize the sacrifice that we Thank made. you, Ryan. I love you. Brandon. Well, I didn't prepare a closing statement because I don't anticipate this being the last conversation we're gonna have. Um, this is just the beginning. You know, I am your guy. You need something done, come to my house. Like I started to hint on in my opening, you know, you can reach me directly on my cell phone, 626-827-6335, night and day. And my wife is probably just mortified right now because I keep my cell phone right next to the bed. Call night or day, I really mean it. You know, what we have here, the, you guys showing up speaks enormously on your passion for the city that we live in, you know. We embrace and I look to preserve, you know, exactly where we're at and to, to expand, you know, the bring businesses that we, that we drive to other cities to spend our money, you know. This is, this is San Dimas, this is our pride and joy, you know, and I look to raise my family here and I'm not going anywhere soon, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I will read the closing statement from candidate Eric Nakano. As we end, I want to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to participate uh, by reading the statements that I would have given tonight. I also want to thank each of the candidates for stepping forward and sharing how they want to make our city better. Public service is a noble calling, and I salute each of you for answering that call. We are the strongest when we can work together. Before she passed away, my mother, who was a public school teacher, would often say that there were two types of elected leaders that she worked with. People that want to be something and people that want to do something. The leaders that want to do something were the ones who made a, a difference. Well, I'm running because I want to do something. I want to improve our downtown, tackle our city's crime and homelessness, and fix our budget. I'm running because I want to take all that I've learned from my degrees in public policy and my MBA and my experience as an executive in the private and public sectors to make our city better. While I was unable to be here in person, I'll be sharing answers to tonight's questions on my website, eric4sandemus.com. Okay, Emmett. I may not finish my opening statement because I can't be outdone by Ryan. Pam, I love you. My, my three children, I, I support. I love all of you who support me. Thank you very much.
special, special thanks to the San Dimas Chamber of Commerce for hosting and moderating tonight's forum. Thanks to all of you for coming and participating in your democracy. My name is Emmett Badar and I am running for mayor once again. Although I have served the city for over 30 years, my work is not done. I am truly dedicated to my three-point plan and believe that together we can make a great city of San Dimas an even better place to live, raise our family, work, and, and own our own business. I know that together we can be successful. I respectfully ask your vote on an, or before uh, Tuesday, June 7th. And I'm going to take the last couple of seconds to acknowledge Dennis Bertone, who's been on the city council for, God, since I was born. And, and um, <laughs> Dennis will be retiring at the end of this year, which is creating the opening uh, for the, uh, either Eric or uh, Brandon. But Dennis, thank you very much for everything you've done for this community. Okay, Ruth. Thank you. Um, we need a mayor that values community, business, and our beliefs. As mayor, I will offer a fresh perspective that includes collaboration between all cities and works towards a common goal of creating a safe community that values both evolving ideas and new concepts. I ask that we work to resolve our differences, produce common sense solutions to complex problems, and work on maintaining a dialogue between the council and our residents. As a chemistry teacher and leader, I bring the best blend of skills and technique to this council and our city. I also want to thank my husband and my wonderful children for their love and support. And I ask that you vote for me, Ruth Luvan, for the mayor of San Dimas. Thank you. That concludes tonight's forum. So uh, I want to take a second to again thank all of you, the community, for attending the event. Uh, special thanks to all of our candidates for uh, spending time with us on this Thursday Cinco de Mayo to, uh, to answer the questions provided by the people. Uh, as a reminder, as uh, Emmett just uh, alluded to, the election is Tuesday, June 7th. We encourage everyone to vote. Thank you all, have a tremendous evening, and please uh, stop by the tables outside. The candidates will be on their way uh, shortly to uh, meet with you and answer any questions you might have face-to-face. -face. Thank you all, good night.